Well, first, I just wanted to start by saying congrats on this series. Uh, thanks. We're super excited. We get to learn all about Bumpy in the 60s and his influence. I'm wondering, from your perspective, what influence do you think he has on the current society, on this uh, this new generation? Um, well, I think that when he was coming up and with Malcolm and and Adam Clayton and all that, that they, they made certain really impactful decisions that happened in the community. There were riots that were going on, the decisions that have affected today. You don't think about mm -hmm. that things all fall upon the shoulders of the past, but it's it's true. Yeah. You know, and I think uh, some of the iconography of who they are, you know, for people, like, they aspire to not necessarily be a, a drug dealer or a, a gangster in that way, but to have that kind of empowerment, that kind of power, and to be able to command that kind of authority. Mm -hmm. I think is important that and Malcolm and Adam Clayton all like have these kind of representations of that. Absolutely. And what did you find the most intriguing about Malcolm X and Bumpy's relationship? Just uh, honestly, I mean, I, when I first became involved and we were like just deciding from an idea that when I found that out, I was really fascinated. I didn't, I didn't know mm. about that. And like, it makes some sense, you know, since he's a Detroit Red, he was like into a uh, criminal world. I mean, Malcolm X was, uh, in, before when he's Malcolm Little, yeah. you know what I mean. Um, so I guess I could see you can see where they would have crossed. Yeah. But you don't really think about it, and I definitely don't think about. I hadn't been thinking about how the criminal world affects um, the civil rights movement yeah. and the politics of the day. I guess you can think about that when it comes to in regards to like John F. Kennedy and his father, who was a bootlegger, mm -hmm. who like was manipulating things around. I think to get a, get his son elected president. Mm -hmm. You know. I can see that now. I know that storyline. Right. I hadn't seen it in the terms of like Bumpy Johnson, Malcolm X, Adam Clayton. Mm -hmm. This is new. Yeah. And can you tell me what it was like working with Nigel and Vincent on this project? Oh. I mean, I remember when Nigel, we first looked at the tape on Nigel, I was like, oh my God, when he came in and read, he had such an ease mm -hmm. about being Malcolm X. He was like, he sat down in front of us and he was, he was, he started saying the lines. I'm like, this guy, he is Malcolm. <laughs> and uh, and uh, so it's been great because exploring scenes with him is like since the center and, and, and power as an actor has really been great for me. Vincent's like monstrous. I mean, uh, we've got this real big rivalry. His character, in a way, is like more emotionally expansive. Mm, you know, okay. he's, he's, he's more aggressive. He's more like a, not a bear, or like, you know, I don't know, maybe a lion or something, you know. <laughs> and uh, so we come at each other. And it's interesting to see which one of us will survive. Yeah. Ultimately, they both survive. Yeah. One thing I really did love seeing was the family dynamic. I think it's really important that we get to see that, mm -hmm. that uh, sort of part of the story about Bumpy. Mm -hmm. And you being a father yourself, I'm wondering, is there any advice you would give to other fathers who are trying to balance parenthood and being a businessman? I mean, I think I can only gauge it by, by the faults. I think to actually give enough time to be able to be there is really important. And we pass by that sometimes. I think that's, mm -hmm. that uh, leaves a lot of room for like mistakes and concerns and mm -hmm. people's sense of self and stuff like that. And my last question, was there anything, or what was the, the most prominent thing that you learned about Bumpy that you were surprised to learn? And I think it was, understanding what we were talking about when it comes to like how he how his world connected to like the expansion of his community you know and, and how that related to like the advancement of the of the race itself mm -hmm. and I, I guess I didn't really think of him in those terms you think of him as a gangster who runs a community runs 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 Harlem who gives away baby turkeys and stuff mm -hmm. on the holiday you don't really think of it as like the strategic movements of what had to happen yeah. in order to be able to control the community itself and millions and millions of dollars that were being moved in and out all the time. It's uh, controlling the economy and the emotional, cultural uh, perspective of the community itself. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you so much for speaking with us and congrats again on this series. Thanks. Thank you. How did you know that this role was the perfect fit for each of you? Uh, the perfect fit? I'm still trying to, you know, figure that out. It's, it's always a work in progress, you know what I mean? So to say that it's a perfect fit, I uh, can't really commit to that, but um, I say that it's, it's an honor to be, you know, given this opportunity to do as best I can with the role. Um, 
I play Malcolm X, and uh, it's a lot of work that goes into it, a lot of uh, research, and I uh, spend a lot of time just trying to find out as much information as I can, trying to uh, embody Malcolm X as much as I can. Um, and we have a consultant on the show by the name of Professor James Small, who uh, has been very key in uh, helping me along the way. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah, he's an awesome guy. Man. Yeah, he is. Yeah. And because you played Malcolm X before in Selma, did that role or the research from that role help prepare you for this one? How did it inform each other? Of, of course. I mean, it, uh, that's kind of where the research began with Selma. And then um, started by, you know, going to a lot of, like, old video stores that only carry, like, VHS tapes from back in the day, you know what I mean? And took that research and went to YouTube, did a lot of, st as much as I can on YouTube, so much so that I'm, like, listening to Malcolm X speeches in my dressing room down up until the time we say action just so that I can get the cadence and the tone of his voice and the nuances of his voice and embedded in my mind as much as I can right up until it's time to shoot, you know. So, um, yeah, I, it, it's a pretty involved uh, process, you know. And like I say, it's still a work in progress, but um, I'm just, uh, hopefully, uh, the people's response will be positive and, um, you know, and again, hopefully, if we get a chance to move forward with this, the performance will get even better. Absolutely. And Vincent, for you, how did you connect with your character? Well, I don't often um, play Italian Americans. I am Italian American. Um, it's a, it's, it's, it's not the, it's not the kind of part that would would be the first thing on my mind to play, um, because of all the racism involved in it and stuff. Um, I remember when I was younger, when John Singleton started making films and. He asked me to do something once, and I, the part was, was he, the, the character was so racist that I just, I, I, I just asked him to just please just move on from me and find somebody else to do it, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, I like John so much as a filmmaker, and, but it was, just, it was just a bit too heavy for me for the way I grew up, you know. And, um, uh, but uh, this, this is a particular thing. This is a, what we're doing here in Godfather of Harlem is, a, is, is very particular. It's a, it's a story that, that I think can help um, right now, going on, the, the rise of, of the black community back then. Um, I, I think to, to have that in a show now is, is, is super important. So I think that my character is the is the is the um, represents the threat of that black community rising up, mm -hmm. and and you know I, I think that that's important, and, and so I had to um, commit to play it full out and and not pull any punches and not try to soften the character at all and stuff. Um, so I mean that's that's why I'm here doing it. Yeah. That's the re those are the reasons. Yeah. You know? um, uh, and. Uh, it's uh, you know it's so so it's more than a, it's more than just a a, a gangster I'm playing it, it represents the the role represents in this show a lot more to me than that. Mm. Yeah. And then I'm wondering too how this father and daughter dynamic playing out for you. Yeah. So could you talk about uh, this it's troubled daughter? It's not difficult. I have a daughter. <laughs> so could you talk about that? Bringing that. To uh, I'll tell you a little bit. I won't tell you everything. <laughs> um, it's tough, you know. It's tough at being a dad and watching your your girl grow up and and uh, get into relationships and it's uh, you know you, you thank God for the women in my life telling me to stay out of her her business. Um, it, it's it's tough. It's tough. Yeah. And and uh, so I can totally relate to that. There's some scenes in this in this show that that it. it in, in, in this particular show, it has to do with my, my um, white daughter seeing a, a, a black man, yeah. you know? And 
So I can just substitute that for my life easily. Like it's like, you know, um, I may not have any trouble with that in in my life, but there's other things that, yeah. you know, that, that I worry about for my kids. So it's not hard to substitute the things that I do worry about with that. So it's, it's, it's very easy playing a father, um, being a father, you know, of, of two sons and a daughter. So it's, uh, it was, you know, and, and also the actress is, you know, the, you know, the, we did scenes that were just, you know, what the, you know what the coolest thing about what I do for a living is? Is that I still get enlightened when I'm doing scenes. Like, things happen, like, I'm like, oh, shit. Like, for the first time, I think, oh, wow, okay. So for that to still be happening because of what we do, you know, at my age and as long as I've been doing this, it, it's, it's, have, playing, playing these scenes with a daughter were like, was like that for me. I was, I was, I still get enlightened. Mm. Yeah. If there's one thing that you hope the viewers would take away from this, what, what would you say that would be? I would say I would hope they would take away that it's a quality, a quality television show. Yeah. Because I mean, I don't, I don't want to get away from the fact that this is a TV show. This is entertainment. I want people to be entertained. I want people to tune in to epics, watch this show, see great performances, yeah. great stories being told, you know, and hopefully along the way they can come out with a little bit of uh, history. How are you feeling about this show so far? I feel like after the Apollo and seeing the reception that we got there, it's usually you're a little bit like, you know, anxious about the world seeing, and I just want to get it out there, you know? Mm -hmm. It's um, such a positive, wonderful reaction to it, in a, in a real genuine way. Usually at those things, you got to take what people say with a grain of salt, yeah, right? Of because everybody's congratulatory and everything because they have to be. Yeah. But everybody was seemed really, like, proud of what we'd created and happy to have the story told. Yeah. I would love to hear about how you both came on board with this project. What was the determining factor for signing for each of you? I think just getting hands-on material that was so above and beyond, you know, you get you get scripts all the time and you connect with some things and some things you're, you know, you like and or, or some things are kind of lukewarm about, but this was immediately like, oh, this is different and special. Mm -hmm. I was a huge fan of Narcos. It's like w the reason that I subscribed to Netflix back in the day <laughs> was for Narcos. Um, so you, you read the pilot and then see that Chris and Paul, who were the creators of Narcos, are attached to it, and then start seeing like, oh, Forrest Whitaker, and oh, they're talking to Giancarlo Esposito about this. So the whole package um, was so, so exciting. Same. I read, I read the uh, first couple scripts and I read the Bible for the show, which was so good. Mm -hmm. I, I enjoyed reading it so much. And then I also uh, got to read Mamie Johnson's book, which, which is, was, which put me over the, like yeah. I was already on board, right. but like her book and getting to read the history through her words mm -hmm. was so amazing. Yeah. So I think that all of the content that we got before it even started was just amazing. Mm -hmm. So I couldn't wait to get started. Wow. Yeah. What about playing Elise and Mamie challenged you the most? She was an addict and I think I, I did a lot of research and tried to really get in the mind of that and it's it's painful. It's mm -hmm. a painful place to live being an addict and then going through everything you're going through when you have withdrawals, when you're trying to get another fix, when you're going through and it was a lot of sort of living in a very low place to try to understand her mindset. Yeah. 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 But with Mamie, she's, um, she is such an incredibly strong woman. Um, and I've said this before, but she is not a tough woman. Cause I, and I think there's a real difference mm. between being strong and then being mm. hard. And she's not at all been hardened by her experience. Mm. Um, and I think it was very important to, definitely to me, but also to Chris and Paul, um, to find that sweet spot where she is strong and, you know, commands respect, yeah. but is, you know, is still likable and and maternal and sweet and soft in the ways that she is and was. Yeah. So that was, that was challenging. And what was it like for each of you working with uh, Forrest and building that chemistry? Uh, for me, it, it was, it happened in a really organic way, I think, and 
and I think our storyline lent itself to that, building the building of chemistry, because when we meet him, he's been away for 11 years, right? So they get to really relearn each other. In episode one, they start in one place, and by 10, they've really, really grown. Yeah. Um, and just, he's so easy to work with and lovely to work with, yeah. that not hard. <laughs> Say, you know. I think it was a very, from, he was in my, like, second audition for the show, which was crazy. Yeah. But <laughs> it, it was like, oh, hello. <laughs> Um, but from literally in that first audition, just getting to go back and forth, he's like the best scene partner mm. aside from Milton Ash. No. <laughs> and like it was really, it was just really easy. He was so easy to work with, yeah. um, and that just made me feel very comfortable. And he's just so good at his job. I mean, like, just getting to watch him was really nice in the beginning. Like, like I would just sit on the side like watching. Watching for us. And it you're was like, great. Oh, that's my line. No, <laughs> I, I say things now. It. Cool, cool, cool. Right. Yeah. Yeah. What do you think is the most rewarding thing about telling this story in 2019? Hmm. I think for maybe the capacity for it to be a teachable moment, right? We're seeing a lot of what we explore in the series kind of going on now with our, with our politics and socially with this horrible opioid epidemic we've got going on. So maybe the ability to learn from experience. You see what's happened, what's happening again, and kind of where we maybe move away from that and learn from from what's happening in the 60s, what's happening now to build a better future for, for whoever comes next. Yeah. Can you tell me how you're feeling in this moment? <laughs> Like, and I'm like, I'm so excited <laughs> about the show coming out. And uh, and also, you know, as we're talking about the characters, it's a lot of the emotions from the relationship that my character had in the show, which is very tumultuous and talking about, you know, being in love and young and up against great obstacles. Um, that it's, you know, talking about it kind of brings it up again because, yeah, I really invested in the character. Hmm. I'm just, I'm hopeful that people will take some hope from it because I think it's an important time period to talk about in terms of that kind of revolution that went on and it speaks to the times today. So I hope that comes across for viewers and that they watch it and that they like that and, and feel it. Absolutely. Yeah. What do you think is, from your perspective, what do you think is the goal of the show? <laughs> I, I think it goes back to exactly what I said, which is that, you know, it, the goal of the show is to speak to these times now with the epidemics we've got going on, with the racism we've got going on, with this absurd le level of bigotry and this kind of, you know, people learning to come together whilst here um, and, 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 and the hope that, that we get from watching that revolution on screen might bring us a bit closer to trying to do that again. Right, like the polarizing times that were then and now and the level of fight that is required to overcome yes, them. Yes, yes. Which, in 1963, definitely had that and the show really captures that. Yes. And so hopefully people connect to that now too. 100%. Absolutely. There's a lot of great content out there. There's some amazing shows out there, but to you, what do you think makes good television? Television, Something that makes people want to come back week after week and tune in? Really good characters. Getting you behind the characters and wanting to see them overcome these great challenges. And yeah, I really feel like, especially following Bumpy's journey throughout this series, every frame I'm just like, I want to know what he's doing next. And then all of the supporting roles, like Rafi's character in it, I'm just like, the volatility in his character. I was like, oh my gosh, like, it's kind of like watching a car crash. Like, you don't want to look away, but it's terrifying. And it bring, brings so much empathy for someone that's just brought up in this culture that, um, that that's the way that he would operate from there. And I feel like every character you can see where they've come from and what they're fighting for and you want to know how they can get through it. Yeah, absolutely. Was there anything that you learned about yourselves that you were surprised to learn during this process of filming? Yeah, yeah, yeah that we have a lot to work on still, you know? That really, and eyes have got to be open and ears have got to be open, humility's got to be had and we've got to start listening properly. You know, and I feel like I do enough of that, but I realize that I don't do enough. And that there's, in this time now, so much more of that needs to be happening for all of us. So it was an encouragement to me. Yeah, I had a similar experience yeah. too. Yeah. And then lastly, could you just talk about some of the research that you had to do to prepare for this role? Um, yeah, I had to do a lot of research into American history and history of 
gangs in New York and because um, I didn't really know that much about it starting off. So, yeah, I was watching lots of documentaries and learning about Harlem and the civil rights movement and uh, the prohibition and how oppression was leading to the violence then and, yeah, people just getting by, I guess. Um, and Stella being the daughter of the Chindiganti and looking at that family and how kind of eccentric and strange they were in there uh, trying to get away from the police by him pretending to be crazy and shuffling around the village in a bathrobe and <laughs> just it was such wild times yeah yeah I mean for me I just tried to talk to some people who were around during that time who had that experience in the Italian American community and in the black community yeah. and just try and learn a bit so I could bring myself to that yeah awesome yeah. well thank you too for speaking with us